Hey there, Lisa Shea. Okay. Hey. Mike, how are you? Good, good. Hey, Mike, Mike Keller. Oh, you're connecting now. Yeah, he's still connecting. Oh. Somebody's mm -hmm. dog just connected. <laughs> he's a business owner. <laughs> yeah. No. They bark and they bite. <laughs> All right, I think we're doing all right. How about we begin? I think that we'll, we'll start. Good morning, folks. This is Mike Gaviazzo, the president of the Regional Manufacturing Institute of Maryland. And I, I just got to warn you, because I, I just spent a half an hour with this panel. Uh, I'm a, I feel confident this is going to be one of the best webinars that RMI has done. Uh, we have a great, a great uh, group of folks that are going to be uh, uh, presenting today, but real quick, uh, some housekeeping. Uh, just remember, this is going. To, this is being recorded. One, uh, please make sure that your phones remain muted. Uh, if you've got questions, you can go ahead and submit it to the chat section. Uh, and and um, let's see what else. And use the chat feature to some more to submit any comments or questions or any information about yourself that you want to share uh, with the group. Um, and before I get into mentioning the sponsors, I want to let you know that, um, you know, the Regional Manufacturing Institute is, uh, has a golf outing coming up. It's coming up on May 12th. Uh, if you go to our website at rmiamaryland.com, you're going to see all the events that we have coming up, including our champions of manufacturing. Today's event is going to be, you're going to hear about stories. You're going to hear stories of these wonderful folks uh, who have had great experience in dealing with social media and LinkedIn. But the Champions event is all about you telling your story to Marylanders, you as, as a member of the, the Maryland Manufacturing Mosaic. What exemplary story do you have? So please go to our website and check out the Champions page as well. Um, Events like this and RMI in particular cannot be made possible without the generous support of, of a number of folks. And I'd like to mention, first of all, CFG Bank. CFG is a foundational partner of RMI. I uh, can't say enough about the, the bank uh, in terms of their values and wanting to, to help people. Uh, and so today we've got Josh Clemens from CFG on. Uh, Josh, welcome and thank you. Uh, mentioned Mike Kelleher, Maryland MEP. Mike, thank you so much. The Maryland Department of Commerce, big supporter of RMI and our efforts to serve the industry. The Scott Phillips is online with us uh, with the Maryland MBDA, Mid-Atlantic Advanced Manu Manufacturing Center, Baltimore. We love you, Scott. Uh, Baltimore County Economic Development has always been a big supporter of, of RMI. Um, and so I wanna thank all of them for their continued uh, support. Uh, for this particular series, I want to introduce John Butwin, who's with Diversified Insurance. He's the sponsor for this series today. And so, John, uh, I'm going to give you a few minutes to tell folks about who you are and about Diversified Insurance, who happens to be uh, the company that RMI gets our insurance. Uh, full disclosure, that's who we get our insurance mm -hmm. with. Thank you very much, Mike, and thank you, everybody, for having me uh, and representing Diversified uh, so my name is John Butwin. I'm a commercial property and casualty insurance agent at Diversified. Uh, we're an independent uh, agency in Hunt Valley. Um, love working with RMI and uh, look forward to connecting with many of you. Um, we help companies much like yours, you know, put together plans to help them protect their most valuable assets and their people and uh, help them grow and hopefully, you know, make them more attractive to the uh, insurance marketplace. But uh, thank you again. Mike, Stacy, and everybody for having me. Yep. And and John, thank you, because I was also going to acknowledge uh, the effort of Stacy Smith, who I don't think I see her face on here, but Stacy is not only just behind the scenes, she's in front of the scenes. We could not have our as it exists today without the support of Stacy Smith. So Stacy, again, I want to thank you uh, for, for pulling this together uh, and other events as well. Uh, April Richardson, my dear friend, April Richardson, uh, God's been, been, I've been so lucky because he put me in a room with her one day, many, many years ago. And the minute that she started talking, I said, I got to know this lady. Well, I count her as one of my good friends nowadays, and she's a dynamo, uh, bright, uh, a successful manufacturing entrepreneur and, and a long list of other things. Uh, so at this time, I want to turn over to April Richardson, who also happens to be a member of the RMI Board of Directors, who's going to moderate this program and introduce our panelists. April? 
Thank you, Mike. So first off, hello to everyone. Um, so what Mike didn't tell you is that when we decided to do this um, social media, um, when we decided to have the social media conference, he asked me to host this. And um, he sent me an email asking, would you prefer to do this to Oprah Winfrey style or Jerry Springer? So I chose Jerry Springer. Um, so at some point throughout this entire event, we're gonna throw chairs at each other. <laughs> <laughs> or at your loved ones yeah. either. Welcome everyone. So as Mike lovely introduced, um, so lovely introduced, I'm April Richardson. I am a member of RMI and I'm a baked goods manufacturer. Um, and I am also a practicing attorney, a 20 year uh, business uh, lawyer who have a specialty in real estate business and real estate fraud prosecution. So I spent over 20 years in that industry. And um, at the same time I was growing my manufacturing company at the same time while raising my son, on my own. So when I um, talk with you all, I will bring uh, some of my personal experiences um, just so that we could have at least one company that's willing to share um, some of the uh, mistakes, some of the highs, some of the lows, and some of the um, concerns that I've had over the years using social media and some of my epic fails. The panel that we have today, I'm not going to talk a lot. Um, I would rather have us spend time talking with our panelists learning more about them, but also making sure that you guys have the right frame or the right context for this conversation. This conversation is not about teaching you how to like something on Facebook. It is not about teaching you how to do videos or TikToks or anything like this. Rather, we are going to dive into a discussion with experts in different areas of social media and how they use social media for business purposes. We are not concerned with whether you, if you hate or love social media, because it's here. It's here. And unfortunately, it's part of our fabric and we have to figure out how to use the tools and resources in order to attract employees in order to retain employees. So with that said, the format will go as this. I will have um, our panelists introduce themselves in short snippets, and then we'll ask questions. And I may direct a question to one of our panelists, but I expect all of our panelists to jump in, or if they want to pass the buck to another panelist, they can. Then you, as our participants at the end, will have an opportunity to ask questions. You can put them in the chat. I'm going to have to ask uh, Stacy to monitor the chat room for me because I get a little nervous doing that. You can raise your hand. Um, or you can chime in for those of you that are on the phone. I do recognize that those can be difficult. So I will announce when you can ask questions. With that said, let's get into this. Um, I'd like to start with um, hmm. Colleen, you kicked us off before. So can you kick us off again? Absolutely. <clears throat> Welcome. I'm Colleen McKenna. I'm the principal of Intero Advisory. We're based in Baltimore. And since 2011, we have been coaching, training, and advising individuals and companies on how to use LinkedIn as a strategic business tool for branding, recruiting, and business development. So I come to this with my sign in the back that says it's business, not social. Um, everything we do on LinkedIn is intentional, and we work with companies so that they can create a really strong proactive presence and process for using LinkedIn for recruiting purposes. So Colleen, before I have the, before I pass it to the next panelist, what is the name of your book? It's Business Not Social. How original, okay, well, right? <laughs> I've got a theme going here. I've got a theme. So, so I, I just want to make sure that um, our listeners have an opportunity to direct connect with you guys outside of this panel, whether it's through meeting you on LinkedIn, whether it's through writing our uh, getting a copy of your book or whether it's through them hiring you or having some advice come um, trickle down their way. Um, next up, we'll have Erin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Erin Moran and I am the executive director of the Dr. Nancy Grasmick Leadership Institute. It is part of Towson University and uh, we focus on developing competent and ethically driven leaders of all levels of, um, of the organization from first time supervisor all the way through seasoned executives and we support all sectors and industries and we just recently launched in September of last year. Um, prior to this role, I was the chief culture officer responsible for the people experience um, and the people function with an organization called Union Square Hospitality Group based in Manhattan 
Um, they're probably best known for being the parent company of Shake Shack. And I was responsible for talent acquisition, retention, engagement, the entire people experience for Shake Shack and the other 27 businesses under the USHG umbrella. Fantastic. Um, now, Erin, once, um, once we get the dialogue started, she is definitely going to go into um, having you guys understand what does a chief culture officer actually do? Because what's important about her title is the word culture, because every company has one, whether it's purposely curated or it's been curated on its own. That, through this conversation, you will see has a lot to do with how your prospective employees are viewing you from an online standpoint. So next up, we have Joe Claire. Hey, everybody. I am Joe Claire. Good morning, and thank you all for having me. I am a entertainer, comedian, and a radio host, as well as an, uh, I guess I'm a serial entrepreneur. I own a coffee company. It's called the Percolator Coffee Company, as well as a baked goods company. And that's how I know uh, April. Um, I have been doing this fresh out of college since 1990, whatever that was. <laughs> and uh, I went to Morgan State University and I have used social media, uh, you know, in, in a multiple number of ways. But in attracting people to come and work for me, it has been quite the tool in, um, in, in, in what you say, attracting talent. It, it's blown my mind what it's been able to do because on one platform I'm, I'm attracting talent and I am selling my business. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's uh, I can't wait to have this discussion. So Joe's being a little modest. So Joe <laughs> is Mr. Hollywood. Um, no, so not. Joe Claire actually is a true comedian. He has been to almost every major city and state um, in the US. Yeah. He's been on, um, What's the name of the show that you used to host on BET? I used to host Rap City on BET. <laughs> Rap City on BET. For those of you who used to, you know, in the, you know, in the '90s, early 2000s, when we thought that we were cool, and now that we look at our photos, we say, "Why were we wearing these things?" <laughs> um, but he also, every morning, five days a week, Joe had to get up early in the morning and host the morning show on WPGC, where. Tens of thousands of people had to tune in to him every hundreds morning. No of, pressure. Hundreds of thousands, hundreds of hundreds. Up, oh, sorry, Joe, my bad. <laughs> hundreds, not tens. Not that you can't get hundreds through tens. Um, so the pressure in terms of making sure that his message is resonating. If you ask me, that is kind of like getting your employees to show up to work. If you kind of just flip it that way, because he had to find a way to make sure that his audience members were listening to him every day. And he also had an opportunity to grow through social media while being on air, because at some point during his career, social media became the thing, not yeah. just his competitor, but also his launch pad. So I want to kick this conversation back to Colleen. Colleen, when I had an opportunity to talk with you yesterday, you talked to me about the importance of LinkedIn mm -hmm. to attract talent, because most of the people on this call are manufacturers in some sort but they are having problems keeping employees and attracting employees. First, give us an overview on how LinkedIn can be purposeful in that journey and how you were able to use LinkedIn in order to help some of your clients uh, solve these very issues that we're dealing with. Great, thanks. It's a, such a great question. Um, LinkedIn, you know, there are two places that most candidates go to learn about a company and the culture, and that's the website and LinkedIn, even if they're going through Google. So even if they're not on LinkedIn because they're those um, frontline workers maybe, or in the plant, and we worked with a lot of manufacturing companies where they're like, you know what, a third of my people are not even on LinkedIn. Doesn't really matter in, in that sense because if people just are going to Google to learn about your company, LinkedIn profiles are going to pop up. So we spend a lot of time talking about creating a really strong presence. And from an SEO perspective, LinkedIn really helps with organic SEO. So, you know, in a session where I'm doing an online training like this, I'll say to people, go Google, Google yourself. What comes up? And typically LinkedIn comes up. So it's really critical for people to build profiles and a digital presence that goes beyond their profile being an online resume and it actually becomes a marketing and recruiting tool. The number one most important piece of content on LinkedIn for every person is their profile. So imagine you have 100 people or 50 people or 10 people, strong profiles talking about the fact that you're hiring and what your culture is about creates greater opportunity. 
And what we want to do with LinkedIn is not just post LinkedIn jobs that are open in your company. We need them to be shared into the networks of each of your employees. So we're going to talk later about how important employees are in the stories, but we've got to get it into the network. So Mike was saying a lot of times, um, you know, manufacturers are looking for engineers. Well, guess what? Engineers are connected with other engineers, right? R&D people are connected to our other R&D people. So we need to leverage, we need to build and leverage strategic networks. Um, very often what I see with um, internal HR and recruiting teams, they're filling requisitions, they're not building a strategic network. So that when a search comes up, they've got a really good group of people who are already first level connections. Every connection in LinkedIn, every one first level connection connects you to potentially 400 additional people. So having a really strong network but strategic in nature is critical because LinkedIn looks at the relevancy of your network. So presence, that profile, building a strategic network, using the company page to talk about culture and create posts that are of interest um, for both, you know, what is happening at your company, maybe clients and customers and what they're doing with your products, and as well as, you know, blog posts and white papers and videos that you're doing. So building a robust content platform through your company page, when you put them all together, it really raises the, your online presence. And then drives people back to the website. So remember, we're always trying to get people back to the website. So LinkedIn is a really very strong platform organically and really supports what you're doing on your website. But they need to mirror one another in a really significant way. So Colleen, one of the one of the um the the problems that I had personally in dealing with LinkedIn is that I was looking at LinkedIn like I was looking at it like Facebook and Instagram, wondering if success on LinkedIn means the number of likes that you get. What I learned from you is that it's not about the likes. You use LinkedIn for the deeper connections, connecting with like-kinded people, connecting with like-kinded organizations, and that's how you build your community. Correct. Can you talk to us just about... Um, how you build the community and when you when you are accepting someone, I think it is accepting someone on LinkedIn. What does that mean? You remember when we talked and I was like, yeah, I kind of feel when I was kind of fumbling around with LinkedIn, I was just accepting everyone, accept, accept, accept. And what it was doing was kind of creating chaos with the, um, you know, with the back part of LinkedIn because they didn't know who to connect me with because I was all over the place. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right. So I'm all about not necessarily having the largest network. Now, third party recruiters, many of you may work with third party recruiters. You may be one um, You're going to have a very large network. Right. It's a database. So it's not unusual to have to see a third party recruiter have 10, 20, 30,000 first level connections. Completely makes sense. That fits their strategy because they need to be, build specific databases for when they're doing searches for their clients. If they have a practice area, a focus on manufacturing, technology, healthcare, you'll see that more of their connections fit in that category. So to me, it's about building a network that's highly engaged. Again, strategic. You might reach out to somebody today um, and you might be using LinkedIn Recruiter. I would still connect with those people. So if, again, if engineers or R&D or salespeople or operations, customer service people are people that you're going to be hiring a lot of, build a network around that so that when you do those searches, you get more of those people. Now, again, related to the post that April and I were talking about, LinkedIn looks at engagement. They reward you for good content. They reward you for having that strategic network and then for engaging. So it's less about the views and how many people are actually commenting and sharing or sending that message or that post to other people in their network, right? And we mention people so then other people will like it. April put up a post that was absolutely a great post and she got a lot of engagement on it. So she had a large number of views. Mike had one of those too. But what was more important was the engagement piece. And with the engagement piece, the more LinkedIn saw on the engagement, the more they pushed that post out. So we, again, want to be really 
thoughtful and strategic with what we do. And as it comes to, as it relates to job posts, we've got to say to the people on our, in our companies, can you share this with your network, right? Can you position that post so it's of interest, right? It has a graphic, 45% more engagement if you have a good graphic with it. So it is that network. I can't emphasize how important it is for everybody in HR and recruiting to build a network that is strong. So you're not just filling requisitions one off, but you do have people that you can go back to. Somebody who you talked to two weeks ago may not be ready today. Five months ago, you might be in a place where you need that position filled again or another of those types of positions. And you can go back to those people, build relationships. It's all about building relationships. To Thank your, you, Colleen. Go ahead, Joe, your, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback because to your point, um, uh, I mentioned I have hundreds of thousands of people who listened every morning and, and all of those things, but the uh, I found, and I had to find out the hard way that the engagement part was what counted more than the number of followers I have. I can reach hundreds of thousands of profiles, but if I'm not getting, the engagement of it, it may be just something that you swipe by. And I found out in the last six months that taking care of that network building that you were saying, that you were talking about, Colleen, um, has been like the absolute uh, best thing I've ever done for, or well, one of the best things I've ever done for my business in that it, it, it weeds out all of the extra stuff and extra noise that social media has around it. It, it takes away some of the uh, novelty of it and gets right down to the business part that we're all trying to sort of concentrate on. And so I, 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 I'm glad that you brought that up and I can't stress it enough how, how beneficial it's been to me um, to, to actually make sure that I'm doing engaging things consistently and then going back and touching uh, you know, those people who show up all the time in my feed, we have a relationship now and, and it's actually turned into um, people coming to act. Can I work for you, Joe? Like out of the blue, that blew my mind. But then people would actually buy tickets or um, purchase coffee or, or things of that nature where they didn't do that before on the radio when it was felt like I was just throwing out a big net. So uh, I'm just piggybacking on what you said, Colleen. That's great. So Joe, can you talk a little bit about just um, how you use Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube in order to um, attract attention and then what type of attention is coming your way and how do you use that in order to number one get your message out about what it is that you do and when you are looking for help how has that um, platform how have either of those platforms helped with your job um, your uh, employee hunting so all of the, uh, the the three that you just mentioned I, I approached them like most people in the world did I thought it was just you know another extension of something to do every day and I watch the growth of social media. And since I'm in media, you know, we, Hollywood, the New York and everybody said, you've got to get your numbers up. So it was every day, can I do something goofy in front of the camera? Mm -hmm. And that got tired quickly. Um, but what, what, what I saw was once I listened to my, I have a guru, April, you know, my guru, uh, Denise, um, once I listened to my guru, guru and she talked about some of the things that, Ka that Colleen said, I noticed that Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, if you consistently go in with something interesting, it doesn't have to be the most entertaining thing. I'm not sitting on uh, Instagram doing a 45 minute comedy set every day. I'm, I'm getting up and being a regular guy in the morning, drinking coffee and talking with people every morning at 9 a.m. Um, what it's done is it it's given people an insight into me and into my businesses that they didn't have before. They thought it was just, you know, I'm a comedian and I get up and I just go do comedy. But when they saw that I had appointments to take care of and I had to do uh, some of the networking all day and I had to do edits and I had to, a real business to run, um, people started raising their hands and saying, well, hey, Joe, if you need help, give me a call. And, and then at first I, I thought it was crazy. I was like, nah, they, it, this can't be real. This this can't be serious until I took someone up on it. And, and I had a lunch meeting and she showed up with her resume, her briefcase. She wore, you know, the best outfit she could. She came in to impress me. And she is now uh, the first employee of the Percolator Coffee Company. <laughs> um, it, it, it blew my mind. Um, it, it was, it. I, I took someone's advice 
I shut off the noise that I had in my head about social media and I saw that it actually worked. And so I leveraged that against getting more numbers. Now it's all about the engagement. It's about telling the story, the uh, the good story. Um, you know, what happened over the weekend at my kid's soccer game and sort of weaving that into what it means every day for your cup of coffee has helped. It has helped immensely. And you would think that nobody wants to hear that. People actually want to hear that. They want to hear it a lot, actually. So um, that's how I've left all three of those. Yeah. So Aaron, this question is going to be for you. So mm -hmm. just as a side note, um, maybe last month, Joe and I had a uh, dinner with a bunch of friends and they're all influencers and really smart people. And they're all bothering me about why I don't post on social media. And I said, it's uncomfortable. Like, um, they're like, well, people want to hear from you. I'm like, well, I can't tell, but I don't want everyone following me. I don't want that person following me. I don't want that person because if they do, then it looks like those are my friends. And I was always taught, um, whoever is with you, Pete, you, you may have to absorb their personality. You may actually have to absorb their reputations. Right. So I've always been really, 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 really apprehensive about just accepting everyone on social media. And it wasn't until um, Joe and his team had me understand a little bit more about the data analytics behind who is in my network. But then my biggest issue because what I couldn't understand until a little bit later, it wasn't about the people. It was about the culture that I was trying to create for my company, because I knew that if I could create the culture that I wanted, that means that I'm going to attract the type of people, customers, employees, friends that match my culture. Aaron, yes. chief culture officer at Shake Shack. Tell us a little bit about what that means and how you were able to sh shape culture and use social media um, in order to engage employees. Sure. So uh, my role is actually in most organizations is maybe a chief human resources officer um, or a chief people officer. But um, with Shake Shack, the primary goal was about the culture. And obviously, we need great people in order to have a great culture. We need great leaders to have a great culture. But the emphasis was more on the experience versus kind of calling it your traditional human resources. Um, and we had a very strong marketing group uh, and their responsibility was to help us get as many guests to come dine with us as possible. Um, we, that group did not, they were not as, um, uh, as capable of selling us as an employer, right? So it's a very different skill set. Um, and so what we decided to do was to have our people tell their stories and to um, create a bunch of different fun, funky competitions to have our people share authentic, meaningful snippets about what their work experience was like and post on social media throughout any possible outlet and to tag us. And then we would give away different kinds of prizes and you know, we'd have competitions among the different shacks about which one was the most creative, because what we were realizing was that even if we pushed really, really hard from our website to sell ourselves as an employer, considering that institutional levels of trust are at an all time low, it maybe wouldn't matter nearly as much because people are more likely to listen and believe the people that they have on social media, even if they're not really closely connected with them, then they are likely to believe the information that you're publishing about yourself um, on your website. And so we, our people, um, share, we asked that we ran competitions like, um, we called it a mission moment. So tell us a story about when you felt that, that either you or a team member really served our mission. So we were telling a story not only to promote us as an employer, but we were also talking about our culture and our values. Um, and we found that to be an incredibly effective tool to help us attract talent. And talking about your culture and your values, I, I read a statistic somewhere that said um, recruiters spend 10% of their time recruiting and 90% of their time fixing the mess that they did when they did not properly hire the right person. And um, the uh, writer went on to say, it's because when we have HR teams uh, or we're working with recruiters, we are not spending enough time 
talking to them about the culture. We are allowing them to set the culture for our company. Can um, any one of you or either of you talk about setting the culture? Ideas that you could share with our viewers or listeners about how do you set the culture? And once you set the culture, how does that impact retaining employees? I, I can start and kick us off. Um, so what we did was we kind of thought about it in terms of different parts of the body. I know that probably sounds weird, but head. Um, so what do we feed people's brains, hearts? What are we feeding their um, souls? Feet, what do we stand for? And then wallet or satchel, what are the, what, what's the compensation? And so we tried to effectively communicate that employer value proposition as part of our culture. So that was the give, if you will. Um, then we also had the get. So we said, here's what you, here's what you, here, sorry, that was the get. That's, this is what you get as being part of Shake Shack. Um, here's what you need to give. So we had a list of, of behavioral expectations for all of our people connected to our values for how we wanted to treat one another in the organization. And so in the hiring process, we would let people know both. Here's what you get, but here's what we expect of you. And if you don't think you can sign up for these, then you're probably not the right fit for us. So we were exceedingly clear about what those behaviors were with a whole lot of specificity. And there were lots of people that often opted out because they're like, mm, I don't know if that's, if that's really my jam. Um, so being clear on the front end uh, helped us. I think clarity is what would help so many companies. And I think because we're always in this constant, you know, um, haste to get things done, we forget about uh, taking time out just to stop and think about our company and our culture. And if we did have leadership stop to do that, then the, that would become a waterfall for establishing the type of people that we need. And it makes it easier for our recruiting, um, you know, partners to bring those people into our company. Now we have, um, lots of positions that are unfilled in the state of Maryland. And um, those positions are not necessarily C-suite level positions. Those are entry level positions. Colleen, if, if these are entry level positions, the assumption that I'm making is that entry level employees are not necessarily on LinkedIn. So what do you tell employers um, how LinkedIn can still be a resource for attracting entry level employees? Well, first I wanna challenge the presumption right, which is, <clears throat> have you actually done a search and gone into LinkedIn and tap into it as a database? It's a search engine, just like Amazon, Google, Netflix, and looked for some of those entry-level positions. Because I do think more and more people are familiar with LinkedIn than they were maybe five, 10 years ago, and they realize that is a place where employers are. So went first, challenge the assumption, go do searches around certain titles that you're looking for, see what shows up. Um, April and I, we just did that actually yesterday, right? And, and we actually yeah. saw that there weren't a lot of people with the title Baker on there. However, I then want to expand that a little bit and what other keywords should I be looking for? And because there's such a um, talent shortage, you know what? I might need to open up some parameters here and be looking for skill sets, soft skills and at different attributes. So I can bring some people in that might be a little bit non-traditional, but we can train them, we can teach them, et cetera. So I'm going to use LinkedIn that way first to, uh, to, to challenge the assumption. And then I'm still gonna build out a really strong presence because I loved what Aaron said about being really, really clear in those conversations. So those conversations, I'm sure, Erin, that you and your team were having with potential candidates was also reflected in the digital presence again, right? So there was a good understanding before anybody even got into that interview or that phone screening or Zoom call. This is what we, who we are. This is the company. These are, this is our mission. This is our culture. And they should have an understanding. They should have an understanding about who the leadership is. Most, most people want to know who they're working for in leadership um, today. So again, challenge, build a presence. And Again, whatever's happening on LinkedIn is going to be reflected outside of LinkedIn as well. So people will still be able to find you. And, um, and then you have to really think about what channels 
you're going to need to build where those frontline workers, those entry level people are. You know, um, I was on a similar call to this last month, and we talked about handshake using Handshake to find entry-level people because they have done a really great job of getting into the universities and colleges throughout the country. So a different community. So understanding where you're going to find your audience and those candidates and having a presence there. I'm so gonna, oh, go ahead, Joe. No, I just wanted to speak about culture um, and, yeah. and, and uh, you know, building and maintaining the culture that, um, came up earlier I have I made a culture of you know sort of the the opportunity awaits if you take it kind of culture with what I do every morning um, what I do every day on Instagram and and through throughout social media is you know make it clear that the life that I've been able to build for myself as an entertainer and as an entrepreneur can be had if you go and take uh the opportunity to make an opportunity. And my last three, the last three uh, interns who came through here have been following me for a while and saying to me, you know, I could help in this regard. And, and of course I'm sitting over here thinking I have it all covered. I've got it. I don't need that until I said, okay, well, let me take a, let, let me, let me take you up on that. And what I found was that they reflected my mission back to me. They, uh, they would say to me the same things that I had in my head. Uh, they would say it to me and, and not me necessarily saying it every day and building that culture. You know, we are a culture of love and peace. It was just, you know, I would do stories about love and peace or I would talk about it, or I would have a love and peaceful way about myself. <laughs> and I found that that culture, um, you know, just made the other people I made them talk to each other and build a community around that. And it's, it's, it's been a source for, um, you know, talent for me, you know, over the last, even do, throughout the pandemic, people are still coming on. Can I come and work for you, Joe? What can I do? How can I help? Um, and I, and I attest that to that culture building thing that um, is so, 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 so important with social media. So some of our listeners have jobs that need to be um, fulfilled by quality people um, with various levels of um, degrees. What piece of advice could you give them now um, to help them attract employees or potential hires at the um, entry level, mid-level and senior level? I, I would say one of the most important things is story, 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 and story, and story, mm -hmm. and your story. Um, like you said, people engage in, pe people trust people. People don't necessarily trust brands or companies. Um, the story behind what I do, how I got here, how, how I became a comedian with a coffee company, a comedian with a cake company, a comedian with a media company, um, telling that story, showing the, the ins and outs of fighting with this camera or trying to fix this light and or buying the light or, you know, having to quickly do a, a, a meeting, a Zoom and hop on an airplane, telling that story, um, you know, has has been like, you know, it made, it, it upped the ante and gave more value to the viewer. And therefore the viewer started to think of me in a way outside of just entertainment, this possibly may be a place where I could work. And while the number of viewers is bigger than the people who thought they might come to work, I still could use those people who, I need those hands. I need those people to come on and, and help me get this done. So uh, story, 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 and story, and story, and story, and story. <laughs> and I wanna build on the story, 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 story theme for a moment um, and share, cause I completely agree. I love what you just said, Joe. Um, and um, it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes ever from Maya Angelou about people will forget what you did. People will forget what you said. People will not forget how you made them feel. And so that's, I think, the power of storytelling is eliciting that emotional connection and then that you know, kind of signifying a memory um, that, that you know, creates more connections for us. And I'd love, love to build on that. 
Um, I love the story, 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 how people make you feel. <clears throat> and I think it's really important to be continually networking and talking to people. So we can build this presence, but we do need to have conversations and, and everybody is busy and everybody's like, ah, I don't have time to talk to people. Your network, again, should become your referral engine so that at some point, it's not necessarily you reaching out, but people are saying, hey, I want to introduce you. This is a great company. And how do we turn the people that we know into a referral engine? One of the ways I think we do that, we become that center of influence. So we're constantly thinking about that engagement on... <clears throat> Who can I introduce you to? You know what? We're not hiring for CFO right now, but you know, I know um, an HR person in another company in Maryland who's a manufacturer. They, I think, actually are looking for a CFO or an engineer. Let me introduce you. And being that center of influence, it's you know very similar to what we talk about on the sales and business development side. I think recruiting people and building a process for that and being really proactive is the same as it is on the sales and business development side. Who do we know? Who are we talking to? How are we getting them excited about our company? By telling those stories, making them feel good and being super authentic because we, we do need to be authentic. So they when they join us, they stay with us. Kyle, now, what you have used, you, oh, yeah. I just want oh, to say, ahead, Aaron, you, please. you used the word referral um, and that reminds me of something that we, we did at Shake Shack and uh, there's a mistake here and I think a success story. So um, we paid referral bonuses for our employees when they brought someone as a, as a candidate and if they were hired. Um, and we were, I, I can't remember the exact amount that we were offering, but we were thinking about how much money we were spending on talent acquisition and, and you know, promoting ourselves as an employer of choice. And we thought, you know what, let's give the money to our people to go find great people. Um, and what we learned was that worked, but we weren't able to retain the people because they were just getting bodies to get the money, but they weren't getting great culture fits. So what we decided to do instead was, yes, we still offered a re referral bonus. So when that person got the job, then the person um, that was referred to us got, um, got a, a bonus, but we also did a retention bonus. So as that person stayed with us, the money that they kept accumulating over time continued to increase nice. and increase. And then both the person who was referred and the referee both got bonuses after one year. Nice. And so that really helped us to support not just acquisition, but retention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I the love retention that idea. is super important, super important. Yeah, so one thing that um, we want to underscore is stories, right? So it's not always a story that is going to be positive, a positive experience of your employees. So part of respecting social media, I find when I consult with companies is also looking inwardly at your current leadership team to figure out why can't we keep people here? Why is it hard? Why is it that people leave so often under this person's level of type of management? And that to me means that companies have to do a, a, more, a tougher job in terms of looking internally at their leadership styles, the communication levels, and if they are culturally sensitive and if they are getting it right. Because when companies get it wrong, on social media and through media being social, your company now is stigmatized as a company that has bad managers, a company where they don't care about the people. And unfortunately, once your company becomes stigmatized in that way, it is hard to attract talent because word travels quickly. You'll see it in Reddit. You'll see it online when employees get angry and upset. And the uh, metrics behind social media is feeding that to people when they're searching your companies. Let's talk about the work that some of the companies may have to do in terms of coming to grips with how they themselves are operating and how they themselves could potentially be missing an opportunity to correct challenges within. Can I jump in on this? I think Absolutely. this is so fascinating. Um, I had a client years ago who got really just ripped on Glassdoor. So first response was all my favorite people who are still here, go post something positive on Glassdoor. Guess what? Big backfire, really, really backfired. I was like, that was absolutely probably the worst thing you could have done. Um, 
it's getting letting leadership really understand how these platforms work. Um, I cannot tell you how many times over the course of the last 11 years um, when I'm doing CEO groups and, you know, they'll say to me, you know what, I don't like this because and I don't want my people to look good on LinkedIn because they're going to get recruited away. And because I'm always about you've got to make your make sure your your employees look good on LinkedIn. They're part of your brand, really, really critical part of your brand. Make sure they look good, especially now when people aren't going to people's offices or trade shows as much. Right. And so, you know, LinkedIn's not or social media is not the reason people get recruited away, though, you know, very respectfully, my my comeback is. Um, LinkedIn makes it faster, more transparent. Facebook makes it faster, more transparent. But it is a reflection. People leave because something's happening in that leadership team or in that company that needs to be addressed. So the onus is on every company to think about these things in a more thoughtful way, to be more transparent, to be more authentic, to have the leadership team be the face of the organization and understand how these tools work and how they can put their thought leadership out there so they can, again, I've used the word a number of times, authentically build trust because people do trust people more than they do trust companies. So I think it's an internal question that needs to be um, addressed with a greater understanding of how they can positively um, create, you know, goodwill and goodness in, in, in the world through digital platforms. So, so um, at Shake, oh. No, go ahead, Aaron, please. So at Shake Shack, um, we did an annual engagement survey and we thought that that was great feedback for our people. And then my CEO and I um, had got, gone somewhere together and we got out of our Uber and we, we got on our phones and we gave the tip and we rated our Uber driver. And both of us just looked at one another and we said, oh my God, an Uber driver gets more feedback than our leaders do, right? Because they're constantly yeah. getting feedback for every single ride that they have. So we, we dumped the annual engagement survey because it was so antiquated and we started doing post shift ratings so that we could pulse our people every time that they were leaving to understand how they were feeling about that shift. And we kind of took that and called it the 411 approach versus the 911 approach of getting ripped on social media or glass door or whatever that looks like, because we could kind of understand like a heat map where there were some problem issues and where we needed to intervene with some leadership support. I yeah, love really that smart. idea. Yeah, super smart. I, I recently had a had to be the uh, the manager who had to admit that things were messed up in <laughs> in the company. I um, had some shipping issues and some order issues with this coffee brand, and people were showing up on my live feed that I do each morning saying, "I did not get my coffee. What kind of company is this? You suck!" <laughs> and it's me. <laughs> it's like they're telling me, like, Joe, I love you to death, but you suck when it comes to coffee. And you, you suck when it comes to delivering and so on and so forth. And Beth, who was my first employee, had to sit there and watch me um, not hide. Uh, I could have easily, oh, the, the supply chains are, are messing up and I've, I've, I've done all of it. I said, you know what, guys, I, I dropped the ball. Um, I was I was as honest as I could possibly be. I did add some jokes in there. I put some levity in it because it, it does sting when you have to admit that you were wrong. But when, what ended up happening was uh, Beth, who at the time was not, you know, all the way sure she wanted to work for me, came on wholeheartedly like, <laughs> I got you. I am going to, we're going to make this company the best coffee brand on the planet, so on and so forth. And she, like I said, three other interns came and showed up. So the the opportunity to be transparent was there. I took it and I would suggest that, you know, in this day and age uh, where, you know, you can see anything on your phone, you can go to your phone and see anything. You might as well be just as honest and transparent um, mm -hmm. as you possibly can because, it's impactful and you will, you'll, you'll have people who are ready to go, but you'll have other people who are ready to jump in and, and lend a hand. Thank you, Joe. So um, we're going to allow uh, questions to come in. 
But before we allow the questions to come in, we talked about stories. And that was one of the things that confused me the most. If I am a CEO of a company, what do you mean tell a story? Um, how does the story look? We only have 30 seconds online to capture person's attention. Are we telling stories about the widgets that we make? But I think from hearing from all of you, you all, it's not necessarily telling the story and overselling what it is that we're selling. It's about telling the stories about the people that work in the company. And I find that when we tell stories about the people that work in a company, people that identify with the person that's telling the story now understands what type of culture you have. And now that opens up the door for someone saying, hmm, I can see myself working there. Um, MPT and RMI did something very similar there. Um, where MPT came and uh, went behind the scenes of some of our manufacturers in Maryland. And they literally filmed for an entire day in some of our manufacturers. They filmed the people and the process. And it was probably, I think it was the second um, highest viewed show um, that came on that night because it told the story about the company, but it also showed and we heard from people who were actually making the widgets and making the products. So that resonated with so many people. And then it showed the end result of the people and the process and exactly what that widget was. So it also gave pride um, to the viewers to say, wow, that's me right there. I can do this. Manufacturing is no longer um, the manufacturing days of the 50s where people are in steel mills and they're sweating and it's a sweatshop. Manufacturing can look any way that a company wants it to look. It can look cool. It can look sterile. It can look cold. But at the end of the day, it has to look attractive to people in order to gain employees. So I encourage everyone that's listening to ask questions because we have a fantastic um, panel that can answer pretty much any question that you may give, or we can point you um, in the direction of a better resource. So let's just start. There's a question here. Um, from Taylor Murphy in the chat section. What is your advice for changing a negative culture that has been in place for a long time and employees who have stuck around but have bad habits and attitudes themselves? Anyone can take that question. A guillotine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> With the <a> cleanup crew. <laughs> transparency. I mean, really, the transparency. I think these this day and age, that actual... Um, you know, we've, we've developed a negative culture, everybody. We're trying to change it and tell that story and get that out. I think that resonates. I think the honesty and the transparency is today, number one, is the number one thing. We've, we've, we're, we're post reality television. We're post uh, having all kinds of things going on in our world. So honesty and realness is, is going to be the key for that, I believe. It also starts with humility at leadership as well, um, you know, because it, everything starts at the top. We all know this. We, if the top puts their head in the sand, if the top does not want to acknowledge that they are setting the culture, then you're not going to get far, unfortunately. Colleen. I was going to say there probably needs to be some reconciling um, with some leadership, right? And what people are doing and what that North Star is and working with some, some people that can help them set a new course because it sounds like some transformation needs to happen. I don't like the word transformation so much, but we got to set a course for some change because it's if you're an awesome company and you're doing all the things right, it's hard to find great talent and keep them. And if things are not set in place um, in, in a good way, uh, it's going to be even harder. So you want to make that change. Aaron? And so, what, uh, so I didn't mention this about my background, but prior to Union Square Hospitality Group, I worked for Great Place to Work, which is the organization that partners with Fortune Magazine to publish the 100 Best Companies to Work For list. And they also consult organizations on exactly this question, um, which is how to, how to turn around a culture and make improvements. And um, the approach that we would take was to go in and to try to clarify what are the skills and competencies that are required for someone to be successful and what are the behaviors and, and um, attitudes that we expect of people and then holding people accountable to both. And it's not good enough just to have one or the other, right? You can't be you know, with a great attitude and no skills and you can't have the great skills but a terrible attitude, you have to have both. And those that can't, um, either modify their attitude or eventually build the skills need to be exited from the organization 
Um, and the ones with the bad attitudes have to be exited faster than the ones that don't have the skills, because at least there's an attempt to try to build their skills and they have a natural kind of emotional intelligence uh, to be able to have the positive attitudes in the workplace. Absolutely. We have another question in the chat room. And, and I think um, we kind of talked about this. I said, people are going to ask, do you have a resource for some story videos that we can do for ideas? Because we talk about stories, but I don't think that everyone understands what does that mean? I mean, are we turning on our laptops and just saying, hey, here's a story about my company. Paint a picture for us in terms of how stories from companies show up on social media. What does that look like? I would say um, where we've seen it work best is when marketing, HR come together and we start to coordinate some of these efforts because again, you don't want to just be operating in a silo or just say, hey, you know, post, post a video, but there does need to, to be some coordination. And typically the marketing team or marketing person, consultant can add in um, some really good ideas, build out a content calendar so that, you know, four things don't get posted in, in two days and then nothing gets posted for six weeks, right? That's not helpful either. So consistency, um, themes, messaging that is somewhat um, given some thought and coordination, I think is incredibly important here. Putting that on, you know, and what we talk about is your LinkedIn company page and then start to talk about employee advocacy, getting that video, that, that, that snippet into people's networks again. And Colleen, we can post those videos on LinkedIn. Yes, absolutely. LinkedIn loves video, loves video. So, so I'll, I'll put, put this out, which is, this is my phone, right? So um, that's how our people captured stories was in the workplace when it was safe, when they weren't by, you know, the, the fry machine or getting burned. We asked them we, to, to pull out their phones and to capture moments, what they were wowed by. We called them wow moments to say when somebody went above and beyond and you were really grateful as a team member, pull out your phone, capture that, ask them some questions, make it really fun and interesting and post it and then tag us. And that way, you know, our people are, I completely agree with Colleen about marketing and HR partnering together for a strategic plan, but also the organic opportunities mm -hmm. of capturing those beautiful moments that happen consistently and inviting your people to post it. So do we have any questions from anyone um, on screen or on the phone? I have a few more questions in the chat room, but I didn't want to skip. Going once, going twice. There, there's a question that um, comes from the chat room, and this will be our last question because we're going to have to wrap it up at some point. Um, do you have any recommendations for how to get a warehouse atmosphere more attractive in order to attract employees? And I don't think they're talking about making it pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say uh, starting with asking people that are currently there what unmet needs that they might have or what things that they might want to have or experience, starting there by asking the question um, and then seeing what might be within the realm of possibility. And if you can't follow through on some of the things that they're asking for, letting people know why, because people understand that there are some limitations, but if you're going to ask for the feedback, we need to be able to respond to it both affirmatively as well as if we're not able to follow through on an idea. Christina, one thing that I'd offer, um, and I'm making an assumption here, warehouses are normally um, not close to attractions, perhaps doing something cool like inviting food trucks to come in for the day so that we can have your employees get access to food. Those are cool things. Putting in um, a Pac-Man machine, you know, just to break up the monotony of the day. Those are small things that, you know, some of our warehouse partners can do because I think physically you're talking about just how drab and boring warehouses can be. Bring some excitement in, have game night, do some things that are after hours because remember, everything doesn't have to be done during your work hours in order to engage your employees. There are all sorts of things that you can that you guys can do after your work hours. But at the end of the day, um, we are all facing such a huge task of um, finding, attracting, and keeping talent. But one thing that I would like to um, just end on because it is 1030, is before we start to curate messages about our companies outwardly, 
we really have to take a look at our organizations inwardly to figure out if who we are online is actually matching who we are as a company. And I think once those two come into alignment, then we can make adjustments and then determine whether what area or what type we need to work on. Keep a happy workplace. People that are toxic should go. If you yourself as a manager or an owner is toxic, you should go um, because it's disruptive to everyone. But if you are doing something right within your organizations, continue to do that thing right and build upon it because we have an obligation as business owners to be great to people, to be kind to people, and to make sure that we are operating not just with profit, but also with purpose. I thank you all um, for the opportunity um, to host. Um, because I chose Jerry Springer style, I'm going to now throw my chair at the audience um, <laughs> and then get lawsuits. Um, but um, Mike, did you want to have anything in close out? Did you want to remind yes. um, our audience yes. of anything? Well, I'd like to add to the list. I have fun activities at the warehouse. Send Joe Claire over there. That's my <laughs> idea. Yeah, right. Oh, Great yeah. idea. I that. will turn your warehouse out. <laughs> I will turn your warehouse out. Coffee Go. with Joe. Coffee, Coffee with, with Joe. Joe. See, now we talk. Now we uh, talk. <laughs> also, I want to mention, um, because there was so much conversation about uh, organizational culture, which we know that is what leadership's about, that the, over at the Dr. Nancy Graswick Leadership Institute, I believe Aaron actually teaches a class on that topic. Is that yeah. correct, Aaron? Yes, I just want to mention correct. the folks. So you might want to check out their website. Uh, I'm sure it's it's an excellent program. Well, I'll, I'll add one more thing and we'll put it in the follow-up email, which is yeah. if um, just for this group, if you'd like to register for one of our upcoming programs and not have any fee, just put in a promo code, great leaders, and you all can have access to complimentary wow. programming. And we will make sure that everyone that's on the call um, will receive um, all of the panelists information so that you all can reach out to them individually. Um, make sure that um, you are taking a look at your company's LinkedIn profiles. And Colleen has an organization where she can um, do um, an analysis and not only do an analysis, but come into your organizations to help rewrite them for not just you, but also for your team members as well. And to also teach you all um, the benefits and the tools of LinkedIn. Again, Mike, great idea. Joe Claire is not just smart, but he's also entertaining. People want to laugh and receive information at the same time. Um, so we have such a great collection of information that's here for you today. Your last Part thing, two. thank you. Three things. First of all, great presentation. All right. Secondly, um, we're going to do this again. Those of you that are listening, there will be a version two and a three and a four probably. We're working with all these folks. They're great resources. Uh, but I want to end with um, uh, thanking everybody, but also give Mike Kelleher from Maryland MEP. Uh, RMI is working with Mike. Mike is putting together a workforce conference. And Mike, if you want to just kind of stay, you know, 10 seconds on, on the workforce conference. Sure. Thank you, Mike. And and thank you, everybody. The conversation today was was fantastic, really exciting stuff. And as Mike said, we're we're hosting on June 8th, the first manufacturing workforce conference. It's going to be at the BWI Hilton. Um, and a lot of the content that was was discussed today will be featured in in breakout sessions. So we have nine different breakout sessions. April is is going to be on a panel talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Aaron's conversation about culture in the workplace is, is going to be one of the topics that we discuss. So I would encourage you to register. It's a great chance to get everybody together and, and, and discuss more of the, these topics and some more. So you can find that registration on our website and I'll even drop it in the chat for everyone um, if you get a chance to, to take a look at it. Thank you, Mike, and great, great. job, Pam. Yeah, it was and a pleasure again, hosting you. you all. Thank you. All right. Thank you, April. Thank you, panel. And we'll see you the next time. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.